us go ahead and get ourselves going after a little delay with all the AV setup, but hopefully we will recover. So uh, today we are going to go continue the uh, path of looking at our integrated building systems, um, looking at specifically the structural systems and how we actually take them from the point of being right on the edge of being able to analyze them to actually, uh, actually using the uh, analysis tools to do the sizing of the members and then ultimately re-import that information back into Revit. So if you might remember from last time, we had looked at some very basic Revit structures and thought about exporting them to some structural analysis tools. The tool that we used here in class was actually Robot Structural. Okay, and uh, we are able to get our models over there and start to compute just really what the efficiency of the different members is based on how heavily they're loaded relative to the existing sizes of them. But what we'd really like to do is use Robot Structural to go through and give us some feedback about what the necessary sizes should be. And in some cases, that's going to be involving uh, like uh, making some things bigger if things are currently undersized. In other cases, it may be that we're actually going to shrink some things down since they're oversized. Okay, so we're going to try and go for this optimal balance between the efficiency of the different members and there's all sorts of constructability considerations about how many different sizes of members you would like on the side, how complex the project or the, the overall structure might be. A lot of times we'll do things that are a little bit suboptimal so we don't optimize every individual member, but we often sort of optimize them in classes so that oh, every individual member isn't you know, different, that you want to sort of keep things uh, fairly regular. It gives you a little bit of uh, flexibility in terms of reconfiguring things. Okay, the second part of class though, we're going to move into HVAC systems and specifically look at one aspect of HVAC systems. We're going to look at ventilation, okay, which is the whole notion is pushing air around and really what we need to do and accomplish, what our sort of requirements and our goals are for pushing the air around and then thinking about how we can model those things in Revit. Okay. Relative to the integrative design project, you should be thinking about a week, uh, scheduling a check-in time for some time this week. Um, at this point, you're hopefully looking at sort of the structural framing, uh, having a pretty good sense of where that is in the process. Um, it'd be great if at this point, if you have a structural model and an architectural model, if you could put them both into BIM 360 glue so we can kind of take a look at them in an integrated way sort of walk around together and sort of look at how the structure and the architecture are working together. And then for this week, it'd be great to go through and choose some few elements that you're going to go through and do some structural analysis on. And I'll demonstrate what I mean by that kind of relative to our little model. The idea is if you took your entire structural model with all its complexity across all the floors and the entire space, it might actually be too big in terms of what you can accomplish in the short run. So what we'd like you to do is go through and select a smaller portion, just a bay or two, where we can really very precisely say we put the loads in this place, we put the boundary conditions in this place, and we can just really analyze those as opposed to everything going on in the structure. Just really to scope your work down, to make sure that it doesn't get to be too overwhelming for you. Because again, for most of your structures, and there's some really interesting and large structures kind of floating around in the class projects, um, it may just be beyond the scope of really what you want to accomplish to go through and do an analysis of everything. So I want you to have the feel, but not necessarily have to do it exhaustively. Okay. Uh, in terms of uh, another little unit exercise, I don't think we've written one for this week, but we uh, are going to put out something that basically has you kind of take your little unit structures that you put some structure into last time and just do some analysis on some of the members. So it'll be something like that, just kind of drawing out what we do today. Okay, so in terms of where we are overall, in structural analysis, we prepared an analytical model. We sort of worried about structural floors, walls, we put some boundary conditions and loads on them. And then we were gonna go through and transfer it over to an analysis tool. Again, I was using Robot Structural because that's one that you know, is freely available to everyone. Uh, I like to use it just because I'm familiar with it. If you're already familiar with eTabs and are used to working with that as a platform or any other platform you want to, you just basically need to find a plugin that'll let you export your work to that platform and then bring it in there. So if you're an eTabs person, again, the place to go just to get some initial guidance about that is if you go to Bimtopia, you will find 
some instructions. Let me see if I can find them there. Under Global AEC, you'll see sort of uh, instructions on installing eTabs on your computer, which is a good starting point. And then you also need to install, there's something called the CSI X Revit connector, which does the extraction and transferring of the information over to eTabs. But to get ourselves going in terms of uh, looking at the project we want to take on today, we're going to basically pull our little uh, sample project out. We're going to pull it over to Robot Structural. I'm just going to go through the workflow of like uh, analyzing some uh, different members and sizing them. And then what we want to do is basically bring the resized members back over to Revit. So you could actually sort of uh, see how that actually incorporates itself into the model. Later we'll talk about scope and how we sort of differentiate between the entire structure and just selecting a piece of the structure. Okay, so if you can, please join me over in Revit. And in Revit, what we'll do is I'll go back to, it's actually the example I originally put in there was in, under session 11. If you can open up the structural analysis examples and go to steel, you'll see here's this little simple frame. Let me go ahead and bring that up. We'll re-export it over to Robot Structural. And we know that when we export over to Robot Structural on some of these machines, because they aren't the most updated, um, it may give you some messages about trying to reconfigure Revit. We found that the best thing to do on these machines is just to continue to hit the cancel. Okay, and eventually the structure will get itself back over there. But on your own machines, you should be able to kind of continue to say, okay, 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 and let it update it so you don't get that every time. But here's the idea of my little model. I basically have this little kind of, oh, one bay model, and I have both uh, columns, I have boundary conditions, I have some beams around the outside edges, I have some beam systems, and finally I have this load. And I have a kind of simple load here. This is like just a live load right now of about, what, 50 pounds per square foot. Okay. Let me also go and put a dead load on here just so that we have a little bit more so you sort of see there's different loading cases. So again, come over to the Analyze tab. I'll say, let us go through and, oops, hang on. Apply a load. I'll say a hosted area load. Hosted area load means that I need to have a structural floor or some element that can host it to uh, grab it. It's a structural floor, so then I can go ahead and just choose the whole one versus drawing the area load if I only wanted to do a sub-portion thereof. But I'll just do the hosted. Put it down. I think I did just put it there. I think there's two on top of each other right now. Let me say that there's going to be a dead load of, I'm going to call it minus 150 pounds. Just so, eh, it's a little bit big looking. Okay, so now I have these two loads, one on top of each other. What's going to happen is we could either do it in Revit or you could actually just do it in the structural analysis tool. Um, combine those different loads, those different individual loads together into different load cases that are prescribed by code in terms of what you have to analyze. We can define them in Revit. Uh, we can do that, let me see if I can find it in here, load combinations and load cases. So I can define different loads and different formulas that kind of work together. Let me go to a load combination where I can go ahead and say, oh, for example, Oh, I always have to remember this. What do you call, oh, the, there's the combined case. Is it 1.6 times the dead load and one plus one times two times the live load or the other way around? I'm always very bad about that. Oh, 1.6 live. Okay. So I'm going to say, let's go ahead and give it one. Actually, I think I have to do it. I have to do it down there. They put in there 1.6 times the live, was it? Yep. Okay, thank you. Plus 1.2 times the dead load. Got it. So what I've done is I basically edited the formula here that's putting it up here. So that's a combination. And oh, we can kind of classify it in terms of whether that's a serviceable or an ultimate state. 
put different information in there. But this is really just building up different load cases if you want to keep track of them in Revit. Truth is, you don't need to do this because what will typically happen in the structural analysis package, it'll already define the load cases that are necessary you know, based on the different regions, the different code requirements. So we'll say, okay, super. Again, one thing I typically do before going off is I'll check the member supports. That's just really gonna make sure that everything is supported. In this case, there's boundary conditions under everything and all the beams are hanging together. That looks good. And also, I usually uh, go through and analytical consistency checks. Just, just go ahead and see if there's anything about the analytical model that just seems to be inconsistent because if it's inconsistent as far as Revit's concerned, chances are it's gonna be inconsistent as far as the structural analysis tool is concerned. But this little model is fairly straightforward. So let us go ahead and take it over to Robot Structural. So the way we do that is if you have the extension, okay, the structural analysis toolkit for Revit installed, you should have a menu at the end of the Analyze tab that says uh, Structural Analysis and gives you sort of links to various tools. If you don't have that, again, what you need to do is Oh, back over in our coursework site, you go to software installs and you'll actually find the toolkit right here, structural analysis. So if you download that and install it on your individual machine, it'll put that kind of series up there in your toolbar. Okay, if you're coming at it more from the eTab side though, where that shows up is a little bit different under the add-ins, if you install that, oh, where did it go? Is that where it is? Where is it? I want it to be under add-ins. That's just showing me the Navis works. Let me think about this first a second. Why is it not showing my ACSI? I want it to be there. I'm in 2016. I know I installed it. I just gotta think about why it's not showing up right there. It's not under extensions, it's under add-ins. Yeah, there should be two more choices down there. We'll think about why that is in just a second. Okay, let us go back to analyze. So if I want to send this over, what I'm gonna do is choose under there, and please follow along with me, choose of the various choices here, I can do a reinforcement code check, or in this case, I'm gonna do robot structural analysis link, at which point it will ask me, do I wanna send the model or update the model? In this case, I'm sending it. It's going to ask us, do I want to create an intermediate file or just open it directly? I'll say open it directly. And I get to sort of choose send options. In this case, the one that I'm going to choose is send the entire Revit project as opposed to only sending the current selection. But you'll see if instead I had selected a sub portion, I'll just choose a few things that aren't actually a kind of a valid model, but it'll be a few things and I say uh, analyze. Now I'll have the choice of only sending the current selection. Okay, so I'm actually gonna select it all. But what I wanna do even before we get there is just open robot in the background. The reason is, again, robot tends to put up some uh, dialogues that uh, require you to say okay. If it's open and you've already okayed through those, you probably won't need to deal with that. So I'm gonna just robot, open robot. And get myself to a kind of a nice clean slate. Okay, and that's looking okay. Um, if you've already sort of uh, agreed to like all the licensing conditions and the privacy things, then you probably won't sort of get any special messages. But that'll just kind of keep us out of trouble. Okay, so we will say, let us analyze the structure. Send the model. It'll export, and what it's going to do is export the analytical model, the line model we're looking at here. It's also going to export all the member sizes, so all the ones that we currently put into our Revit model based on our intuition about how big the members would be, but not actually, not actually the confirmation about how big they need to be. Okay, so it looks like it exported it. I'm going to say no to the events report. Now. 
as you go through and do this, you may be getting the dialogue where you have to keep on canceling, or is it happening to you again? Is it doing that? And if you can, just keep on canceling. See if you can get to this point. As you guys are getting there, let me just kind of point out that uh, this model has the information that we had over in Revit, and that if I go through and, oh, just turn on, for example, that's the boundary conditions. This is the structural elements themselves. Here's the loads. Now, loads, you'll notice, is only showing nothing right now because it's showing all the different cases. But if I go through and choose a specific case, it'll show the live load or the dead load that's going to be associated with that case. The load values on there. Okay, so again, how I got those is just down here at the bottom of the uh, viewing area, there's a little couple of just widgets that sort of turn things on and off. But let's kind of see how you guys are doing just in terms of having that piece of it up. So, do we have models transferring across? Woo, we do, okay, looking good, excellent. You have this flat view. This flat view always bothers me because I have a hard time getting from the flat view back to the 2D view. Okay, looks like the style has got this default structure in it. It's looking good. Um, oh, it's definitely playing around with this little guy over here. We'll eventually get you back to kind of the 3D view. But usually what I do is I do race for you again or something like that. Yeah. yeah. We've got to learn how to control that. And as I just don't spend enough time in robots for actual finish that. Okay, this print here looking good. It's exporting. Excellent. There's a ticket. Spitting, taking its time. Interesting. Let's see what's going on. Did you open a, a robot, stru robot structure on the background beforehand? No. Okay, it might be sort of waiting on us or something like that. How about this? Go ahead and open robot structural. Let's see if it has its waiting right here. See if you can get to the start menu and you've got to do it that way or and on the desktop or something like that. Sure, but under Autodesk, there's an Autodesk folder. Okay, let's see if we find Robot Structural. Revit, Autodesk. There's Robot Structural Analysis up there. Let's choose that. Okay, so it's okay to all that. Now, in terms, there it goes. It's a funny thing where it just sort of hangs and hangs. So what was happening to Brit was it was just hanging. Okay, looks like it's trying to come in. Excellent. Okay, beautiful. So we're looking pretty good. Okay, here's what we're going to do. At a high level where we started the last time was we just said, let's go ahead and just use this thing as a calculator. So I go to the analysis tab and I say, let's go ahead and prepare some results. So if you say prepare some results, what it's going to go, oh, not that. Hang on. I need to spend more time hanging around here. Let's try calculations. Calculations will basically say, given the existing geometry and the existing load cases, I'm going to go through and do some calculations for you. And what it has done is done some calculations. And right now it's showing me load case, uh, live load one, so case two. I can do it for the dead load case. But really, in terms of what's going on here, what I can do now is uh, I'm going to turn off the little finite elements just because they make it a little clunkier to see things. I can choose a member. And if I go through and say, let's take a look at the properties of that member, you can sort of see, oh, what its displacements are. Or we can come over and kind of take a look at its shear bending moment diagrams. Sort of a little bending moment right there, the shear diagram right there. Now, in terms of the bending moment diagram, you might notice that it's not quite zero at the end. That's because since I indicated this is a, a structure that has fixed columns, the columns are actually picking up a little bit of moment at the end. Okay, as opposed to putting braces in there or something like that. That's why it's a little bit off. They're not quite simply supported. If it was simply supported, you'd, you'd be able to predict exactly what will happen there. 
Okay, so let me pause there for a second and see, is everyone kind of there? Let's kind of get a sense of this. Uh, Miss Jacqueline, Mr. Sang Chai, you doing pretty good? Excellent. Britta, did it ever come through for you? Okay, what you do is you select one of the members and right click on it and say object properties. Way down at the very bottom. And now, let's see what's going on. Oh, that's a node. Okay, let's do this. Because I'm actually showing you a lot of information in here, let's go ahead and put this last one over here, which is going to hide the fine elements. Now try clicking on just that bar. Now I'll right click on that. Okay, and now if you say like displacements and say it in Z direction, you get, there we have it. Okay, and if we go to NTM, we can say either the force in the like Y direction, I think it is. That's more like the uh, shear diagram. Okay, where is it? Yep, MZ is the bending moment diagram. That's something interesting there. Why is that? <laughs> Try MY. Z. That's actually kind of continuous there. That's actually sort of like, my, yes, okay, that's what it was. Yeah. Very good. Okay, so now as we were looking at it, we came up with the whole notion of where really is the beam member actually sufficient? If you go to the properties tab, you can see sort of really what the beam member is, at least as currently defined. I say properties over here. You can see it's currently, oh, some 12 by 26. We have the area, we have the moment of inertia in all the different directions. We have the materials properties for steel. So we have a lot of information about the section. What we can do is use this information now and really compute whether this beam is adequate. And it may be adequate or inadequate in typically three different ways. It's actually more than that, but I always think of it in terms of three ways. Yeah, the area usually governs whether or not um, it'll handle the shear, because uh, the area is sort of typically resisting shear. So if the area is not sufficient, we might get a failure where we're able to shear off, okay? We could have a bending failure. Typically what happens with a bending failure is the section modulus is not great enough to go ahead and handle the bending stresses. So it'll just bend out of uh, the shape that it needs to be. And the third one that we typically worry about is just the displacement. And for that one, we think about, oh, just really, is it deflecting too much? So as Jacqueline suggested last time, there's some criteria that we typically use. A very common one is L over 360. So we'd say for the length of any bar, we divide it by you know, the number of inches by 360, and that would tell us how many inches of deflection would be considered allowable. Okay, the beam's not gonna fail, it's just sort of whether or not you want it to flex that much. Okay, so for this beam, which is 30 feet long, you can sort of see it's currently deflecting, oh, well, look at that, that's not looking very good. It looks like it's deflecting, what, like three inches right now? Hmm, that's not very good looking in terms of what's happening. Um, that's probably a little bit too much, so that's sort of a pretty good indication that things are undersized right now. Okay, this is for the dead load case. Actually, I should comment on this. There's always different load cases. Here's the dead load case. Let me switch to the live load case. If you remember last time when we looked at this, the live load case, it was actually kind of sufficient. It was uh, doing okay. It was under one inch, 360 inches, L over 360. It was kind of okay. The dead load is actually much worse because we had, what, I put 100 on there, 150, something like that. So if I go switching back over to the dead load case, you'll see it's deflecting too much. Even worse if we start thinking about a combination of those two cases and adding them together. So clearly that beam is not going to be big enough. The other place you could start to check is individually. You can take a look at the code check right here. You see it has some sort of instability. And even over here, you can see there's a ratio the efficiency ratio you could really think of as being a measure of just how sufficient this beam is. Less than one means that you're on the good side. Greater than one means that you're on the bad side. It's not sufficient. If it's very low, a ratio of like 0.1 means you're sort of oversized and you're not being very efficient about using your material. In a case like this where it's three, we're grossly undersized. Okay, 
So we can go through and do this on a case-by-case -case basis, but let's not do that. Let's go ahead and let it go through and do some of the work for us. And how we do that is, because we could just go through and change these things. We're going to go to a suite of design tools they have built in called Steel Member Design. And let's take a look at this. So if you open up this window, there's really two sub-windows that show up on the right-hand side. One is all about groups of members and then calculations down on the bottom. But let's start just by calculating. We'll just go ahead and calculate and see how bad off we are for the whole structure here. So let's take a look at this. In terms of calculations, we are going to choose which members we want to verify. We can verify a single member, two members, a group of members, or all the members. So 1 to 13 is just everything. So if I come on down here, and even if I say the list, you'll sort of see, you know, if I just put in, I really hate that thing. Okay, Mr. Notification Center, go away. Not there. Are you doing? This is the day where like just computers are going to fight with me. I don't want that. I get the feeling there's probably something hanging off on the bottom of the screen that I have to say okay to or something like that. <laughs> okay, Windows 10, what are you doing to me? Like, I got some dialogue that's up on top of everything. I can tell because when I click on things, um, it just keeps on beeping at me. Let's see what else I have going on in here. Okay. Hmm. I'm sure I had the dialogues underneath it. Okay, so I have these different member sizes, 1 to 13. Another way I get that is I can just say any and put that in there. Or if I know that I really all want to have, like, uh, like for specific, example, specific sections, I could go through and clear this list and say, just give me all the 12 by 26s. Okay, and that's just a subset of the members. But I'm just going to put any in there, get them all for right now. Okay, in terms of what we want to look at, we can choose really what kind of load cases we want to consider, whether we want to consider the ultimate limit cases or the serviceability limit cases, and which cases and loads we want to consider. Okay, so if we just sort of leave them all turned on and we say calculations, what it'll do is do some calculations for us. And let's take a look at what it actually computed. If we go to results, you'll see that currently, for this case, for case dead load one, okay, it looks like uh, the 12 by 26s are a little bit undersized right now. Actually, pretty over undersized, 3.36. The other ones are kind of okay in the scheme of things. If I look at instead the live load case, you see the numbers are different. Actually, probably have to reanalyze that. What is it? It's the limiting case. I guess it's showing me the limiting case. Okay. So, if I look at this, these are the ones, Revit Girder 7 and 8, those 12 by 26, these are the ones that I really sort of need to go through and change. Now, as you look at it though, you'll see that there's some other things that we might be able to improve on. For example, all my columns up here, members one through four, they're only loaded up to a 0.4 efficiency ratio. So I might be able to bring their sizes down a little bit and save some steel. Okay, oh, these 12 by 26s, girders 5 and 6, those are the ends. Um, they're actually looking pretty good at 0.85. I probably wouldn't mess with them too much. Okay, the Revit joists in the middle. Um, what, 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13. 
looks like, well, 0 0.79, 0 0.67. Yeah, there might be a little room for improvement in there. We'll go ahead and check it out. So here's how we approach this problem. What we can do is either try to define everything and analyze it and optimize it at once, at which point we get one size for everything, or we can break them into groups that sort of make sense. And here's the way that makes the most sense. What you can do is think about all the things that sort of belong together, like all the columns are very similar. The girders at the front and back are pretty similar. The girders at the left and right are pretty similar. And even the girders in the middle are pretty similar. They have like, I kind of sort of think of them in terms of being groups. So what I'm gonna do is turn on some node numbers just to help me. And then we're gonna define some groups, give them names and sort of say, hey, for this group, what kind of members would I allow you to be? So give it a little guidance about what you could possibly be. So let's see if we can make this work. So under groups, I'm going to say, let's go ahead and create a new group. Group number one, that sounds good. Okay, it's going to have some members in it. Let's go ahead and put some members in there. I'm going to put one, two, three, and four in there. Okay, so it's going to bring my columns. I can give it a nice name, like columns. So far, so good? Okay. Next thing up is we're going to tell it which members I would allow that to be. Now, which members you might allow it to be, you could give it the whole steel manual, or because you happen to use some fantastic new steel feedback program that tells you what sort of sizes are available and which ones might be the least cost, you could subset it and only put in a you know, list of members that you think are very attractive to you or readily available, okay, or might be available at a low cost. But what we'll do is we'll go to sections. Let's think about adding some sections here. Now, it already knows about the sections that we brought in from Revit, but if we want to put in some more sections and really let it go to town, what we're going to do is say, well, OK, first of all, what kind of shape do we want? I'm going to go for these sort of eye beam shapes. I'm going to choose from the AISC database only because I'm thinking about kind of getting steel here in the US, but there'd be different catalogs for different parts of the world. Okay. You can go on down and look for the section families you want. For example, I'm just going to go to the W sections, the wide flange sections, but I can choose some other sections too. You'll see that what happens is now in the list below, all of the different sections in that catalog that are W sections have appeared. They're all available to us. And it's actually a pretty big list. Now, we could go ahead and remove some of those. If you know that you really don't want the W44 by 335, we can take that out and kind of remove it from the consideration. But I'm just gonna like choose all of those W sections and say okay. So go ahead and do that. See if you can, for the columns, give it a list of sections that it could work with. Okay, now they're all going to be on the table. They're all available. Okay, and if, if you've done a good job on columns, why don't we go ahead and define a few more groups. Let's define, oh, five and six as being a group, and I might call those the end girders. Or end beams. All right, I'll say a new group. That's going to be group number two. That'll be members five and six. Call them the end beams. As far as the sections go, you'll see it already has the list of sections that we threw into the list for the columns. It has, we can add some more in here, but these are the sections that are available to it. And I think that list is probably going to be sufficient. Okay. If you have that and that's looking pretty good, go ahead and save that away and give yourself another group. Let's go ahead and this is the one that's really important to me, seven and eight. Those are the ones that are really the, uh, really uh, undersized ones right now, seven and eight. I will say that for those, that's going to be, oh, what are kind of my girders? I could call them my collector girders if I want to. 
Okay, again, the sections, we'll let it be any of those sections. And as a final group, I'm going to make group four. That's just going to have members 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13 in it. And I'll call those like my intermediate beams. Save that away. Okay, so I got four different groups now. And the reason, again, I wanted four different groups is I'm going to do the optimization group-wise. So only the columns choose the best column. Only the collector girders choose the best. Otherwise, if I do them all together, they get one size for everything. So the columns will be much too big because it's going to base it probably based on those collector girders as being the worst case. Okay, make sense? Okay, how about on your side? Do you have a group or two defined? Okay, excellent. You don't have to have them all, but if you at least have a couple, that'll work. Feeling good? Feeling good? Okay. Let's go ahead. And what we will do is now say, as opposed to doing member verification, we're going to do a code group design. Okay, and you get to say which group you want to put in there. And we actually have four different groups that are already set up here. So if we just want to look at the columns first, let's try them. Put columns in there. Super. We can now go ahead and do some designing, choosing whether we want to do ultimate stage or serviceability. We can also choose whether we would like to do some optimization. I'm going to turn that on and let's think about some of the choices it gives you. We can optimize this based on trying to minimize the weight. We can op optimize this by saying, well, there's a maximum section height or a minimum section height if you want to sort of limit the choices somehow. A maximum or minimum flange width or thickness, a minimum web thickness, calculations for the entire set of sections. I'm not sure what that one does. I'd have to go to help to find out. But I'm going to do it based on weight right now. Weight is often a criteria people will use when they're sizing members. Yeah, people will tell you that it's actually not necessarily the best criteria because that turn gets into the raw cost of the material, but it may not be the actual lowest cost in terms of fabrication and what needs to be done to the beams after they're together. But we'll go for weight for now. Say okay. Okay, and you are ready to start optimizing. So. Let us go ahead and say, oops, calculations. So here's what it's telling me. For code group one, okay, uh, currently, oh, uh, what do we have here? If I go through and choose the 14 by 38, that's a little bit low. 10 by 39 is its recommendation for what would be the best size that would meet the criteria. Okay, and 8 by 40 would actually be a little bit bigger. Okay, so a little bigger than it needs to be. It has a slightly uh, lower efficiency ratio. So the idea is we're just going to choose one of these now. Okay, so if you would like to choose these, if you'd like to choose the 10 by 39, what you do is say change all. Okay. Here's what happens. Because you change the structural stiffness of the columns just ever so slightly, we actually need to go through and recalculate before we do the next member. So maybe a sensible way is to actually do the worst case first and then kind of cascade to the next one out there. But every time you change something, the structure stiffness changes just a little bit, so you have to kind of rerun the calculations. So I'm going to say yeah. Okay, close that up. Now what's happened, because we actually have changed those, is if I come back over here and choose this member and choose its properties, you'll see it should actually be now the 10 by 39. It went through and updated it, so the model now is updated and it's a little bit different. Okay, let's try this again. Let's go for, we know, the ones that are really bad off are these. These are these guys, what are they currently now? They're currently a whole bunch of 12 by 26s. And we know 12 by 26 is going to be just a little, you know, 
a lot too low. You know, our efficiency factor. Any guesses as to how big this might be when we uh, go there and resize it? You know, if you were thinking about trying to resize these, what sort of things would you do to that beam to uh, kind of give it extra capacity? I know about the slenderness ratio, I don't know what the governing case is, but I don't actually know. I'd have to look into a little more information to kind of really figure out exactly how it's uh, failing. So, well, I don't know the answer. What, how might you approach it? What are some of the strategies you might use? Oh uh, yeah, if you were gonna, if you knew it was uh, undersized right now, what could you do that would sort of make it better? Look at it's probably failing in the moment. Okay. And if it's failing in the moment, then what, what, what property do we try to change? Yeah. Okay. Well, though the moment inertia usually has more to do, it, it has more to do with the, 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 the flexion. But it's typically the section modulus for bending moment. Yeah, I see. Yeah. Okay, but if we were looking at these properties, we're going to make it taller, we're going to make it heavier, or both? Uh, you, want, you want thicker flanges. Okay, so thicker flanges, which will probably make it heavier. Yeah. Okay, so it might be that it goes to be like a W12 by 33, it might be a W12 by 42, it might be something like that where the weight per linear foot gets heavier. Yeah, or you can increase the depth. Okay. Yeah. So you have a greater. You're you're off the central axis. So you're distributing the. Uh, it has a greater moment of inertia at that point. But there is a funny relationship. Like either strategy, they're sort of related together. Like you can't make it too tall without making it get much thicker, or then you start having a problem with the slenderness ratio. There's this whole other thing. Yeah. It, it kicks in in a funny way. So. We have a member size over here, 12 by 26. Let's go ahead and see what we come up with that. So if you want to look at those, we'll say, let's do the code group design, and we'll do the collector girders. Actually, let me clear that out so I can just get the collector girders. Only three. Okay. If I want to optimize this again, oops, before I run it, I have to go through and do the calculations over here. I have to say analyze, calculations there, yada, yada, yada. Okay, now I can do these design calculations. Okay, so what it has come up with is, it's interesting, an 8 by 48, okay, is actually just a little bit undersized. I think it's kind of interesting. It was 12 by 26. You can actually go through and decrease the web height, okay, and make it down to eight, but you have to get that 48. You need to get that extra weight, that extra flange thickness in order to go ahead and uh, achieve what it's doing. So we need to get more meat out there. Okay, 14 by 48 is what it's recommending. 21 by 48 would also be acceptable, but that's considered to be a little bit high, that we're not necessarily using all our material efficiently. So if I change these to 14 by 48, What happens now is, over in here, I'm not sure if you saw it, it got a little bit bigger. We can definitely take a look at it in terms of its properties. It's now a 14 by 48. Now the impact of that is, when we go back over to Revit, what used to be a 12 inch tall beam is now a 14 inch tall beam. So, if we were sort of trying to position our ductwork or things relative to it, we have two more inches which are taken up by like uh, this beam. So we could go ahead and say, you know, no, 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 I really don't want to use this. I really want to stick to something that's 12 inches or lower. Okay, and if you really want need to do that, you could say that for our optimization, our maximum section height, for example, is 12. Okay. Now, because we're limiting it, it may give us a very heavy beam because we're sort of subsetting the number of things that are available. 
We'll say OK. Let's try running that. OK, again, I have to do the calculations. Analysis, calculations. Okay, so here it's coming up with a 10 by 60 as being the better choice if it's trying to bias it by the maximum web height or admit you staying less than 12. So I have this choice, 10 by 60, or what was it before? It was like 12 by 44 and 14 by 40, something like that. So this is actually one and a half times as heavy, okay, which means in terms of the raw cost of the steel, one and a half times as much. Okay, not in terms of fabrication, but in terms of the raw cost. So there's a trade-off to be made. If I want to key two inches more for other parts of the systems, then I'm going to have to come up with a heavier piece of steel. And it's, it's tricky to come up with the right balance and the right trade-off because you know, sometimes it's very hard to shrink the structure and then it really compresses you in terms of what you have available for the HVAC system. Okay? Or you might need to change the floor to floor height, which is why actually for the purpose of making your lives easier, for the floor to floor heights on your machines, we were always, oh, go for a big one, 14 feet or something. You know, that's giving you plenty of room where it probably won't be a big issue. Because even if it was 15 feet and we had two feet of steel, we'd still have 13 feet to the floor. So if the ceiling was a 10, you'd still have like a nice three foot buffer to kind of like uh, play around with mechanical. But in a lot of buildings, for example, if you're in the uh, global AEC class right now, they're trying to get three stories and 30 feet. And that's hard to do. <laughs> I see some squinched up faces because that's a, that's a hard task. So you have to really be creative if you're gonna try and squeeze and still you know, keep the building less than a certain height, which is very common. The city may require that. Yeah, as we're working with the cities, they often have height limits. The developer would like as many floors in as possible for as much saleable floor area, but the city is trying to limit the height, or the planning people are trying to limit it so that the building doesn't get too tall. Okay, so I'm not sure I like this one. So what I'm gonna do is go on back to, I'm gonna rerun the calculations. And I'll say, let's come back over here for my optimization. I'll take out that maximum height. Let's rerun that again. Interesting, not 12 by 53. I'll think about why that is. Oh, I remember what it was. Yeah, it was like 14 by 40 before, right? Hmm. Let's try it again. Results. Calculations. That should be on. Nope. Okay, what in that? I'm not sure why it's different this time. It must have something to do with the order of operation. I could go to cheese that. Now it's a little over two. All the cheeses. Okay, next up. And the final one I'll sort of worry about right now is these intermediate beams. These intermediate beams, 9, 10, 11, 12, again, they're 12 by 26s. Let's see what we have to come up with for those. We'll say the intermediate beams are the object of our uh, attention. Okay, let's do the calculations there. Okay. It's like eight by 24. So quite a bit smaller. Well, smaller I'll say in the physical sense, not so much smaller in the weight sense. Okay, 12 by 26, eight by 24, the weight's pretty similar. But if I can go ahead and make those um, a little bit flatter, I'm gaining four inches that might be useful for me when I'm trying to place some other things. So again, I'll change all those. 
Super. So I now have my resize members. The idea is you're gonna go through, resize some things, and hopefully you're not gonna pull some things up. When you are all ready and done, and you have a structure that's feeling pretty good, do this. Go ahead and save it. It's been pretty bad, I haven't been saving it. So let me put that just on my desktop. I'll say it's session 13 optimized. That's a piece of it, okay. But I am now ready to go through and pull that structure back. I always like to say, just in case, you know, computers crash, perhaps you've noticed this. <laughs> so because we don't necessarily trust them not to, well, I wanted to save that first, I'm now gonna go back over to Revit and I'll say, hey, let's go back over to the Analyze tab, Robot Structural Analysis Link. And now what I'm gonna say is let's go through and update the model. Okay, when you say update the model, what it should do is go on out and grab the directly linked model over in Robot Structural, pull it on back in. So let's say okay. It knows that it was linked to that file, it's going through and trying to pull the model back. So as a workflow, this is actually not too awfully bad. Even in a structural engineering office, you might have someone who does the Revit modeling who is different from the person who actually does the structural modeling in a different package. And you want them both to be able to work in the packages that they're familiar with. Okay, I'll say no, that looks pretty good. So let me go ahead and take a look at it in 3D. So now, if I come over to this model, and we zoom on in, let's take a look. Those are now some eight by 24s. Those are some uh, 12 by 53s. And those right now are the 10 by 39s. Okay, so we have this flow through. It's, it's actually, it's a pretty good workflow in terms of doing this. The nice thing is by doing it in this integrated way, a structural engineer doesn't have to come up with an entirely separate model and then do the analysis, and then give you back a list of elements that you have to somehow transpose back in there and make sure that nothing got missed. Another thing that's nice about this workflow is, as a designer, if, oh, you find out that you need to sort of change things around locationally, because you, you, know, you add some beams, you take away uh, some column location, you do whatever you do, you know, that might make a change. Um, yeah, you can just take your model, update the robot structural model, and then readapt and just analyze the things that have changed. But you don't have to kind of keep on recreating models. It's like you theoretically can kind of keep on building your work in a way that's very cyclical. Okay, now that is kind of the overall workflow in terms of a very simple structure, but let's talk about your structures. Because your structure's a little small, or whether they're bigger. I take that back, what am I saying? <laughs> So as Gustavo is looking at his multi-story structure and wincing as he thinks about all the things that are potentially wrong with it, or hard to analyze about it, I should say it that way, you may not want to analyze the whole structure because um, whatever, it's, there's a lot of things that may take a lot of work to kind of get everything just right and make it perfectly analyzable. So here's what you can do to make your life a little bit easier. Okay. If you think about this, if you think about the part that you want to analyze and only select those parts, okay, then we can go through and like, uh, what is that, just, you know, sub-analyze the part that you want. So for example, I'm just gonna get a little difference to my structure over here. Oh, for example, I'm gonna take this little beam over here. Let me go up to level two. I'm gonna pull it on out. There's some little cantilever hanging around out there now. Okay, super. I wanna analyze that and just sort of think about how it's gonna behave with the cantilever. But I don't necessarily wanna analyze the whole structure. I just wanna sort of analyze that little piece over there. Here's what you can do. 
you can go through and create for yourself a view that will make it a little bit easier for you that only includes the things that you want to analyze. And let me show what I mean. I'm going to duplicate this view. I'm going to rename it and just call it oh, Elements to Analyze. And the reason I'm doing this is it's going to be a whole lot easier for me to do this once as opposed to having to go through and reselect them every time. So in this view, what I can do is say that, you know, all these things over here, I'm just going to hide them. In fact, rotate it back up again. I'm going to hide that one. And I'm going to hide that one because I don't really care about analyzing that one right now. Again, only grab the things that you want. So let me hide that one over here. Now, for the floor, since the floor is actually this big old hosting area, if I'm not going to support it on the other side, I can't really represent it that way. What I might need to do is just represent the floor as a hosted line load on top of the beam, or the equivalence of the floor as a hosted line load. So what I can do is let me go ahead and hide that floor even these two loads. What's that? Is that my structural floor? That's the analytical floor. I got things coming out my ears. What I want to do is get some frame, some part of your structure where we have structural elements, we have boundary conditions, and we have some loads on it. Okay, so to go ahead and for the purpose of your structure, really think about just two or three beams. And if you want some guidance about which ones I think will be most interesting, there's always a worst case. You'll find something that has the worst cantilever. You'll have some big opening around an atrium where there's some very long span beams and you're sort of worried about the loads that are coming down. There's always something. So if you need any guidance, we can talk about it. Then, oh, to make this just sort of work so we have something, I'm gonna go say analyze. And I'll put, in this case, a hosted line load to represent this if I wanted like 100 pounds per square foot, and it was, oh, eight feet from the next, it would basically be 800 pounds per linear feet. So I'll say, let's come on over here. I'll make it minus 800. Super. Now, what we can do is select those things. And when you now say that you want to select those things and analyze just those things, you're almost good. You have to still say send options and say send only the current selection. Okay, and then you're okay. So we'll take those apart. He'll convert them, it'll send them over to robot. Say, nah, I don't need to see that report. I want it to be flashing. Oh, you know what it did? That's kind of interesting. It put it in the middle of the existing one. That's because it already, it knows it's the same structure. It's being smart on me. So it only changed that one thing. Darn that thing. <laughs> Let's go ahead and I'll close this up. What are you doing, robot? You're looking at me funny. go back to the main case.
again, I can tell there's some dialogue that's up in a funny place right now because it's I'm not able to kind of click out of certain things. That's just a few views. Let's see if I can uh, get that back up. What is it doing? You hear? I should be able to shrink that. I should be able to shrink that. But what I want to do is actually, oh, there we go. Let's try this again. Go back over to Revit. Send it on over. Again, only selecting the current items. Okay, I'm selected, I do. Okay, good. I want to make sure. Send the model only the current selection. Here's my little model. It's kind of hanging around out here. Again, I can look at the different load cases. Let me get a dead load or a live load. I forget. Okay. If I go through and analyze this, I can. I can go through and do its calculations. Now, notice this time it's going to give me a funny little error, or a warning anyway. It says, hey! An instability of type 1 was detected at node 5 in the direction Rx. Do you want to continue? What it's telling me is basically I have a cantilever. I have some node that's basically floating around out there that has no support. Okay, so that's going to be carried back through the uh, beam. And I'll say yes. Okay, no worries. Two warnings, but we'll live with that. Okay, so now if I go through and choose... Loads. There's the numbers. You'll see that it has its own properties. Again, if I go through and look, for example, at the moments, okay, you'll see I have this kind of a little positive moment, or negative in this case, above the uh, like a column. Okay, and then it's sort of tapering off there. Or even if I look at the displacements here, you'll see. that it's kind of interesting in terms of what happens here. It sort of dips on down. This is kind of a funny one. Can you tell what's actually going on here? This is actually a funny thing. Can you, can you see where the low point is? It's kind of right around 20. Okay, the low point is actually right here in the center. Okay, so what's happening out here at the end? Can you tell relative to zero? It's actually picking up. Yeah, and this actually is this funny thing about continuous beams and why we like them. In a way, what's happening is the length versus the length of the cantilever means that it's actually sort of picking up over there instead. Actually, it's picking up there quite a bit right now, 0.2 inches or something like that. So again, we're still gonna need some stiffness. We don't want that much of a deflection between you know, negative 0.6 to positive 0.2, that's still about 0.8 inches. That's a lot of chain deflection. We still want something stiffer in there. But what's happening is we're getting a little pickup, as opposed to just kind of strictly uh, like uh, having it uh, like a sag on down. Now, cantilevers often do deflect. Don't be <laughs> afraid of that, they just do. For example, I was touring around at the site of a new hospital this summer and they were talking about at the new Stanford Hospital, there's actually these huge cantilevers where the whole building sort of like uh, cantilevers out. Let's see if I can find a picture of it for you. Let's see if I can get the new one. 
Uh, what do we have? That's the, oh, here we have. That's a good little picture right there. So check out this picture. Okay, this is the new hospital. Looks pretty groovy, all right? It's got these gigantic towers in the middle. Can you see how basically it cantilevers a way out over the edges so that when you're sitting there lying in bed, you just have this fantastic view of the foothills and the campus and it's very serene and very nice, okay? So what was gonna happen is as they were building it, they put all these little temporary supports in there to support it, but at some point they're gonna take them out. And when they take them out, how much do you think that thing is gonna deflect? Any guesses? Henry's he, he's ready to formulate a guess. What do you think, Henry? How much do you think it would be acceptable? I mean, how, how far do you think it is out there? It's probably about the width of one patient room, maybe 20 feet, something like that. Maybe 30 feet, I don't know. So how much can it deflect? That's a good guess. I was gonna say, use Jacqueline's rule. So it was L over three, it was 30 feet, it could go up to a foot, or excuse me, an inch, okay? And that's actually sort of what they're anticipating. When they move those columns out, this whole thing is gonna go <laughs> and just kind of like uh, deflect down. But that's okay. You know, it's just sort of the steel does that. Yeah, yeah. Wood does that a lot. Concrete doesn't like to do that so much. Concrete's sometimes stiffer. I don't know. There's like a, every material has its own properties. So if you do have big old deflections, the fact that you're gonna, or you have big old cantilevers, the fact that you're gonna have a deflection is nothing new. You know, there's all sorts of things we can do with a slab to kind of resist it, but it's gonna deflect. So that's okay. But once you go through and you bring it on into the structural analysis package, super. All the same rules apply. Okay, so if you want to go through and do your steel design, super, and we go through and, oh, we'll just do that one big beam there. I'll call it my cantilever beam. Okay, let me go through and Put some nice sections in here that I can work with. All the W sections. Save that away. So if I come down here and I do my code group design for the cantilever beam. That doesn't look right. Well, actually, in this case, it probably does. <laughs> Let's go ahead and do the calculation first. Yada, 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 yada. Okay. So, looks like it wants to be an 8 by 13. If I wanted to have even less deflection, what I could do is go ahead and choose a bigger size beam, and then it would just deflect less. Something like that. But that's kind of okay. In this case, it's not a really very big deflection. Yeah. If I was doing something much more like that, then I'd be much more worried. <laughs> okay. That's what happened at falling water or something like that, where it's just you got very, very big. <laughs> so you really have to worry about how much that deflects. Okay, let me pause there just in terms of all the structural stuff because you've got the basics now of how you can go ahead and take the information, take the real steel analysis package and start looking at it. Um, what we want to be thinking about is just relative to yeah, your structures, like how you want to go ahead and start analyzing things or what you want to be thinking about analyzing. And the key is, again, don't think about analyzing the entire structure because that's probably beyond the scope of what we're up to. Hey. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Would you mind if we pulled the... Oh, please, go for it. Okay. Go for it. See, uh, quiet space. So, 
It's, uh, yeah, you'll be thinking about in, from your structure really what it is you want to analyze. And if you have any questions if during the uh, check-in this week, let's go and talk about which really, which beams are the ones that are probably the most likely and stuff like that. But again, don't be thinking about doing a whole lot. But, uh, if you're two or three, that's okay. Something like that. It's really just trying to get a sense of, from our perspective, how deep those things might be, how big they might be, just so you can then go ahead and size things up relative to uh, the mechanical systems you want to put in there. Good. Does that make sense? Beauty. Okay, let me then go ahead and shift our gears just a little bit, because we are going to go ahead and start thinking about the mechanical systems and how they sort of play with the structural systems. And as we think about mechanical systems, well, actually, I don't think I even got it uploaded. Let me go ahead and upload these things for you. There's a couple of uh, files that I want to put up there for you. Did I get them? Actually, I did get them. They're just not published right now. Hang on, let's just go ahead and do this. We'll go ahead and publish these out there for you. If you can download them, there's some just helpful information to get ourselves started. Okay, so here's the deal. As we start thinking about the mechanical system and placing it in there relative to the structure, again, are all the requirements that we're sort of trying to meet and trying to uh, make sure that we're honoring that'll help us govern just really the sizing of our design and how everything's laid out. So at a high level, when it comes time to think about um, your HVAC systems, there are some high level goals we're trying to achieve, some different performance requirements. And let's kind of talk about that. Particularly today, we're going to talk about the ventilating part. That's the part where we're moving around about a lot of air. We'll talk some more about heating and cooling, the other parts of it, just as we uh, keep on going. But I want to start with just the issue of how air moves around and how you have to think about it. So, as you think about moving air, which is often one of the kind of first things we think about in terms of uh, sizing these things, we have a couple of different basic things we have to know in terms of how the code treats this. If we want to sort of calculate how much air we have to be moving, we typically have to sort of look at the occupancy of the room. So based on every occupancy type, there's a certain number of people per square feet, and there's a certain uh, level of how much air change we have to introduce per square foot and per person that we have to accommodate. So at some level, just based on all the occupancies of all the individual spaces, we'll compute how much air we need to be moving. Now, in terms of how much air we need to move, it's a little bit confusing because there's actually like four different things we try to accomplish with that air. So you get different numbers depending upon which of the things you're trying to accomplish, and you have to move as much air as is necessary to sort of accomplish the worst case of those things. Okay, so at a high level, the way we used to think about it, more kind of uh, universally than any other way, was just the number of air changes. Let's talk about that. So for every type of room, there's this notion that we want to change the air a certain number of times per hour, and that's just so it's not stale or stagnant. And if you've ever been kind of in a, a locker room where the air is just really muggy and still and not moving, or even I was recently in a bus on the way back from a, a race, and like the air just wasn't moving and everyone was in there sweating, and it was just like, you know, windows are fogging up, and it's just not a pleasant experience. Yeah, so we all sort of know this notion of dead air. And if it's not fresh, if it's not kind of moving, we sort of get the sense that it just feels heavy. The humidity starts building up. The, the odor starts building up. It's just, yeah, the air is not good. So one thing we try to accomplish is just keep it moving in terms of air changes. Another criterion which has been added in recently, which didn't used to be there so much, was uh, the notion of fresh air. So it's not that we just need to keep moving the air, but we actually need to introduce a little fresh air too, that we can't just keep on recirculating. Okay, that we have to do that. And if you have an air conditioner in your car, you probably know this concept. If it's a hot summer day and you're running the air conditioning and it's really hot outside, we often go ahead and there's these settings. You can have recirc or don't recirc. And if you want to keep things cool, you turn on the recirc. 
okay? If you want to have more fresh air, you turn off the research. Like, what's the reason for researching the air? Like, why do we do that? Just in your own intuition, why do you do that when you're driving around with the air conditioning on in the summer? Henry, what do you think? Well, it's not, it's not as outside. Well, it could be that. <laughs> you want to avoid the unpleasant odors outside because you're going past the tar plant or the, the cow farm. There's all these different things. How about from an efficiency standpoint? Is there a reason to research the air for efficiency? I mean, yeah, if you're trying to keep cool, it's too hot outside. If you're trying to keep warm, it's too cold outside. Yeah. So what happens is by researching, if you already have air that's pretty cool, it came out of the air conditioner at oh, 68 degrees, it heated up somewhat, now it's 72, 74, something like that, because it's kind of been blowing past you. But when it comes back in and resarks, it's more efficient to cool down that air, which is only a little bit warm, as opposed to pulling the outside air in. Okay, so we like to research. Okay, and same thing happens with buildings. It is so much more efficient to take this air, which is already pretty close to the appropriate temperature, and recircuit it as opposed to getting the outside air, which may be too cold or too hot, and introducing energy to change that. But the problem with that is if we keep on doing that, it just traps things. So there is this guideline that says you have to introduce a certain amount of fresh air. Just, you know, some percentage will be 10% or 20%. And what will happen is if you're required to sort of say there's 10% or 20% fresh air, that means you can pull air. You reuse about 80 of it, send some out into the environment, and pull in fresh air to kind of make up the difference. Okay? So we sort of mix the two together. The other two things we try to do with the air systems are, we often try to use them for heating or cooling. Air is actually pretty good for heating or cooling. We have all sorts of convective systems, like if I just put fans on the ceiling of this room and blow the air past you, that's actually pretty good because the air blowing past your skin, it'll sort of uh, just kind of, you know, some nice, it'll, it'll cool you a little bit on your skin surface. It'll sort of pull some of the heat of the way so you feel a little bit cooler. Yeah, we might also introduce chilling so that we have some sort of chiller which is going to introduce very cool air and blow that around to kind of cool the space. Or we could also use air for heating. Okay, and Really, somehow, all four of those things factor in. So really, how much air you need to be moving really depends on it's all four of those factors, and really, whichever one is the dominant one. Because if it turns out that in order to cool, you need to move 1,000 cubic feet, and for fresh air, you need to 200 square feet, okay, we will move 1,000, and you'll have more fresh air than you needed. Okay? Or vice versa, if you need more fresh air than you need cooling, okay, what I need to do is I need to move the air, but I need, might need to adjust the temperature of the cooling air so that even though I'm introducing a whole lot more, you don't get chilled out. Okay, so we really have to look at all four of those different things. So there's some guidelines for you just in terms of understanding all these different things. You have to do this outside fresh air, you have to do recirculated air, we have several different targets to work with. In terms of all these things, let me start with air changes because that's probably the easiest thing to understand. And let's just kind of think about that real quickly. If you go on out to oh, the files that are hanging around out there now in session 13, you'll actually find there's a couple of interesting documents out there under Go to B. 13. HVAC requirements. You'll find something called minimum air changes per hour. What this doc is, is it's actually something that was on the web. It talks about the older way we used to do this, but let's kind of like walk through it. Basically, for any individual type of building, there's a certain number of air changes that are required per hour. So let's kind of play it out with this, this whole scenario. If, for example, oh, we are in, let's go ahead and look at a school classroom. It's anywhere from four to 12. 12 would actually be an awful lot of air moving. Four is the absolute minimum, but let's kind of think about what the range is. Let's say this room is, just for the purpose of being easy, let's say it's 50, 
by 20, okay, by 10. Okay, so if it was 50 by 20, okay, that'd be a thousand kind of square feet. By 10 would be 10,000 cubic feet. Okay, so if I need to go ahead and change the air four times an hour, it'd be 10,000 cubic feet times four changes. It's 40,000 cubic feet per hour. So if anyone divides that now by 360, okay, you'll get sort of uh, the number per minute, which is the way we typically do this. So if, let me actually do this and say, Where's my calculator? Okay, so 40,000 divided by 360. No, by 60, excuse me. Okay, that would basically be 666 cubic feet that needs to be moved every minute. Okay, now that seems like, well, what does that seem like? Each of these different terminals, we don't really have a lot of terminals in here. We have, we have more down in like 184. Those little registers that are up in the ceiling, each of those is rated for a certain number of cubic feet. And a lot of them are rated for around 500 cubic feet. So if I needed to provide 666 cubic feet per minute, okay, and they were rated at 500 cubic feet, okay, I need two registers. Okay, so as you think about this, we're gonna go ahead and put some registers in just for getting the air changes in there. Let's say two at 500 for kind of introducing air in. Here's the deal. With air, if you go ahead and blow the air in, you also have to get rid of it too because if you bring a lot of air in and push it into the room and you don't evacuate it, okay, you get this positive pressure building up. And it'll eventually leak out the windows or leak out under the door, or maybe blow out the windows or something like that. But you want to keep everything in balance. And in fact, if you've ever been in a building where it's really hard to open the doors, sometimes that's just that the pressure is out of balance, that the positive and the negative pressure is out of balance. So as you're trying to pull, you're trying to push, you're basically pushing against pressure. So we try to keep them very much in balance. So one guideline is going to be this. This is all about this minimum air changes per hour. Okay. Another one that, that we're going to look at, that's another way that we tend to look at it, is just the amount of fresh air. And there's this own table for looking at that. And let's see if I can find that for you here. Ash rate actually determines how many air changes, or how many cubic feet you need to bring in of fresh air. So let's say, for example, I needed 666 square cubic feet of fresh air for the standpoint of kind of uh, air changes, or yeah, 666 cubic feet of air for changing the air. In terms of fresh air, it's a little bit different. There's sort of this whole notion of cubic feet per person, cubic feet per square feet. You end up having to add those two things together, and you get a rate that will actually uh, be a combination of the two. What I did was actually in um, Excel, put together a little calculator that sort of has both those things factored in there. So if, for example, if you're in a lecture classroom, something like this, okay, and we have a certain number of cubic feet per person and a certain number of cubic feet, feet per square feet, if you go through and add it all together, if I did have a thousand square foot classroom, I need about 550 cubic feet. Okay, so now for air change, I know that I need 666. I know for fresh air, sort of air that didn't get recirculated, I need 550. So if I had 1,000 coming in, okay, I need to basically make sure that in the mix, 55% of it is uh, non-recirculated air. So it's air that's coming in from the outside. We sort of play this game of balancing those things. Okay, we're also going to figure out that what we need to do is based on the heating and cooling in here, depending on where our heater and cooler are and how we're sort of introducing it, we might need to use air to convey that heat or convey that cool. And we'll kind of get to that. Okay, but let me just kind of real quickly give you a sense of what this looks like in Revit so you can start thinking ahead. So if you're over in Revit, 
And let me go ahead and open. I put a lot of examples out there. Actually, let me see if I can uh, make sure it's uncompressed. You'll find some that we're going to go through next time, which is all about the duct placement. Okay, if I just open this up. And I'll sort of skip ahead a little bit just to kind of give you an example of where we're going. We're going to go ahead and do some modeling where what we're going to do is we're going to work with a mechanical template because the mechanical template has all the bends and the elbows and the different duct sizes and stuff like that. We're going to link in our architectural model, but we're going to go through and create models that look like this. Where in this model, what we're starting to look at is just a whole series of different air terminals. Each of these terminals has its own sort of rating. There's supply terminals, those are the ones that are bringing the air in. There's the return terminals, those are the ones that are pulling the air out. But for this little building that we're looking at right now, each of these different terminals is rated at 500 cubic feet per minute. Okay. What I need to do is in every room balance them so I have the same amount in and the same amount out. Okay. And the total size of the system is really determined by, oh, just how much we need to go through and supply for the entire system. So in this case, if I have eight supplies, each at 500, my system has to supply 4,000. Okay, it's gonna supply 4,000, it's gonna pull away 4,000. And what's gonna happen in the middle of this whole system somewhere, there's going to be something called an air handler. An air handler is just something that sort of pulls air, might mix it with some fresh air, but blows air back in. So we're going to need an air handler that can actually handle 4,000 cubic feet. Okay, so that's where we're going with this. Just in terms of getting started so you get a sense of it, it's actually pretty easy. What we end up doing is something like this just for the modeling, and I'll kind of leave you with this today. Oh, I can look at it. Let me look at it on the ceiling plan. You have a bunch of things that are sitting here in the ceiling. We have some supply and return terminals right now. What happens is for modeling, what we'll do is we'll say, oh, let's go to uh, systems. We have air terminals. And we can choose either supply or return diffusers. There's ones that go in the ceiling, there's ones that go in the wall, there's ones that go in the floor. We have all these different strategies we can talk about, but I'll just use these ceiling mounted ones right now. Okay, I'm gonna put it at eight feet above the floor, or it might be nine feet, I forget in this structure. Okay, I'm gonna put that in here. Okay, that's another supply one going out. Henry, what you got? Oh, sorry, just... Oh, stretching. No worries. Okay, so I got those supplies there looking pretty good. What I have is a piece of duct work over here, and when I want to connect that supply into the duct, what I do is I say, let's go ahead and take that supply, connect into, and then choose the duct. Okay, and it puts the feet fittings in there. So not too awfully bad. Supply, connect into, put into that duct. So that's actually not too bad. Okay, let me tell you where we get in trouble with this. It, for the most part, works very well. We're going to find out that we can compute spaces. The spaces actually allow us to sort of compute how many people are in them based on the occupancy. It'll help us figure out how much air we have to move. Revit's a very good calculator. It's very good doing out that where we really pull our hair out and have so much trouble here, it's just getting the geometry to work. Okay, because somehow the duct work can't just bend itself infinitely. There's all sorts of rules about the radiuses and how far and how you have to line things up. So where you'll spend all your time hating this part of it within Revit is just over the, it's just trying to get the geometry to line up in terms of making all those ducts work. So on the one hand, running ducts is very easy, but on the other hand, like even here, you'll see that 
this sort of thing is connecting in, and it seems like it's doing okay because there's actually enough room. Let me go ahead and take this out. Let's say, what if instead of being at eight feet, well, I was being sort of generous, this was actually at 11 feet. Okay, and now I say, let's go ahead and connect this into that duct. Okay, you get this little message that you'll learn to uh, despise. It says, no auto route solution was found. All that's telling you is that, given what it knows how to connect things together, the parts that it has available, it can't figure out a way to make that connection. Okay, and that's all it really means. It just means it can't figure out how to make that connection. So it's up to you to figure out, do you need to move the height of things, or do you need to sort of try using a different type of connection to fit it in there? But we'll talk about all that. Yeah, Henry. So we'll actually do this together next time with an example. It's basically based on spaces, okay, and the occupancy of each of the spaces. We'll figure out how many, how many cubic feet we need from an air change standpoint, how many we need from a fresh air standpoint, and how much we need from a heating and cooling standpoint. Okay, and based on all three of those different things, we'll figure out, okay, super, what's the dominant one? Okay, and based on that, we'll put terminals in that number of terminals. Now, where you put them, whether you choose to put them on the ceiling or whether you want to put some on the floor and some on the ceiling, it really depends on your strategy because everyone has different strategies. If you, in this room, for example, there's some returns which are in the back. You can kind of see them over there. That's where the air is being sucked out. Where the air is coming in here, there's actually a couple places. One is right here. Okay, there's just like a little bit of air coming in through this long kind of T-shaped thing, and I can look at a duct, and there's one on the tail in there, there's a register on the end of that. But where most of the air is actually coming in here is, can you see through that ventilation, there's like this round kind of duct, it almost like a dryer hose, and it connects into this big thing over here? That's a chilled beam. And what that chilled beam is doing is, it's blowing air over some heating and cooling tubes. Okay, so the air is blowing past that. The air is coming through these big slots and kind of coming down. But before the air is finished, you sort of heat or cool it right at the tail end so that it has just the right temperature we need in this room. Okay. And that's kind of a very common strategy. So here we have one, two, three, four kind of chilled beams, and we have one, two kind of just caps on the ends of the duct. They're right at the end of this thing. So sunshine, it's almost above your head, just a little bit behind you. Okay, so that's how we're getting there, but we'll find out there's all sorts of strategies. Here's some of the things to think about as you go ahead. If we go ahead and use air to move around heating and cooling, we have to move more air, typically, because to keep it heat hot or cold, we have to sort of use the air and push air to kind of make it uh, kind of stays hot or cold. If you have a building where you start using a radiant system or something that uses water to sort of transfer the heat instead, you often get by with less air. Because then the air is predominantly for ventilation, it's not necessarily for heating or cooling the space. So that's, there's all sorts of little tricks to this. We'll go through a lot of examples of that. Other sort of strategies you have to sort of think about. For example, if here we have chilled beams, we have heat happening right here in the room, which allows this room to be a different temperature than that room, which allows that room to be a different temperature than this room. Okay. If we didn't do that and we just had a big air handler somewhere else, okay, we would have to generate enough heat and push that hot air to the endpoints to make sure that it's still hot enough to sort of achieve the heat that we need in this room. But that is typically not a very efficient system because it, you know, pushing a lot of air is in a very effective way, and then we still have the problem that although we're pushing all that heat, you know, next door we're forced to need that much heat, you know, versus what we need in here, therefore we're overheating. Although, if you think about it in your home, it has an interesting thing, because uh, we have people from all over the world. Brittany, in your home, how is heating handled? Do you know? In most homes, just for simplicity, we, in the US, we often do forced air heating and cooling. 
And it's not necessarily the best system. Oh, very good. In the forest? Oh, in the okay, very good. That's more common in cold weather climates. Okay. Often we'll do forest air, maybe radiators. Okay, they're radiant based porters, something like that. How about like sunshine? When you're home, what, how is your house uh, heated or cold? Sure. Not too sure? Do you have, how about Jacqueline, do you know? How much for you? Just air conditioners. Just air conditioners? And where are they? Are they out on, do you live in an apartment or in a, in a house? It's uh, an apartment. Yeah? Every room and yeah. Okay, and what happens in every room? Do you have like one of these boxes which is sort of up high on the wall? Okay, that's typically called a split system. In a split system, there's a fan within there, and there's cooling that happens right there. There's actually a condenser somewhere else. But that's an example of, as opposed to kind of pushing a lot of air from a central location, yeah, you do it every, yeah. Yeah, in every room. And typically it's all split. There's only in offices in Hong Kong, there will be central. Yeah, otherwise it's room by room. Yeah, that's very common. And so even as we go through, you're going to find all these sort of cultural assumptions and different sort of climate assumptions. Yeah, very often, like uh, in a lot of Southeast Asia, it'll be more like uh, these little split systems and stuff like that. Is it because it's really hot or they just culturalize the, it's really hot? It's a very efficient system. Yeah, so and it partly has to do with the type of construction. If you have a lot of concrete construction, it's very easy to sort of set them up after the concrete shell and kind of get very individualized control room by room. So, okay, we'll talk about all those different types of systems, but that's where we're going next. So, if you can, please go ahead and uh, we'll post some times for checking in this week. Get yourself checking in with us. We'll talk about where you are. We can even start thinking ahead to what your HVAC system will start looking like. But um, I don't know, this is where we're heading right now. So get ready to sort of like turn the corner in terms of really starting to think now about we'll do heating and ventilating and air conditioning. We'll also do plumbing systems and a little bit of electrical. So all those things that go inside of your structural system. Cool, okay, let us adjourn for today.